2 Corinthians 1 verse 5 reads thus. For as the suffering of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. You may be seated. Eternal God and Father, I come before you this morning. Lord God, hide me behind the cross. Lord God, I pray that you may fill my mouth. Cause Almighty God that I may speak to your people on your behalf in the way that you would have spoken to them if you were here. Lord God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Shortly after the dawn of creation, and from all the collections of recorded history to the present time, humans have experienced suffering. The historical record of human suffering are far too exhaustive for me to review them all. However, I would like to remind us of some of the unfortunate catastrophic events and suffering we have endured so far in this year. The Venezuelan humanitarian and refugee crisis. The Sudan flooding caused by a wetter than usual rainy season that has devastated communities across Sudan as the Nile River and some of its tributaries reached their highest level in over 100 years, damaging or destroying more than 110,000 homes since mid-July and affecting more than 650,000 people. That's 650,000 people. The southern border humanitarian crisis with children being separated from their parents. Now that's suffering. As residents of Central America fleeing from their own countries by the hands and fleeing from suffering from their own country by the hands of their own countrymen only to be greeted by another form of suffering at the hands from whom they had hoped would have rescued them. U.S. civil unrest caused by the killing of a number of African Americans and came to a boiling point with the killing of George Floyd. The Beirut explosion in Lebanon causing 204 deaths, injuring 6,500 uh, 6, and causing US $15 billion in property damage and leaving an estimated 300,000 homeless. Now, the wildfires in the Amazon and California. Now, the California Department of Forestry and Forest Protection, they did not give an exact amount of the land that was scorched this year. But it is said in a daily statewide summary that more than 8,200 fires have burnt well over 4 million acres. Now, to put 4 million acres of burnt land into perspective, the state of Connecticut has approximately 3.5 million acres. Therefore, the wildfire in California have cumulatively burnt an area larger than the entire state of Connecticut. Now, the last of the catastrophic event I will mention that we have suffered or rather is agonizing, is still enduring in this year and from all indication into the next, is of course the coronavirus pandemic. The likes of which we have not seen since the Spanish flu 100 years ago. Now this virus has taken more than 1.3 million lives worldwide and over 243 million Americans have succumbed to this virus as of press time that was Friday. Now, suffering is all around us. Therefore, there is suffering in the body of Christ and there is suffering in the world. None of us is exempt from it. In fact, C.S. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasure. He speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts at us in our pain. Now, God can often get the attention of a deaf world through its pain. Yet, the thought of suffering is the most undesirable reality in the entire Christian faith. In my allotted time this morning, I would like to impress upon you the need for all of us then to develop a theology for suffering. Given that suffering awaits all of us, and at one point or another, we all will be confronted by it. Now, 
I have a couple of questions for you this morning. And it is my hope that in my sermon, I will provide answers to you. Here are the questions I have for you. I wanted to give thought to this. How is a believer is to be sustained through suffering? That's question number one. And two, what posture should a believer assume while suffering? We will not suffer as though we have no hope. That's not the posture. We'll see. Now, developing a theory for suffering will undoubtedly inform that posture. You will gain an understanding about God that enables you to see him in and beyond your pain and distress. It will give you a greater understanding of purpose and grace in suffering. Now, developing a theology will open your eyes to the reality that suffering is one of the ways that we come to know God. If truth be told, many of us came to Christ as a result of suffering. Let us first develop a working definition of theology and also a definition of suffering to establish the premise from which I'll be speaking with you this morning. Theology is the study of the nature of God. It literally means thinking about God. In practice, it usually means studying the source of Christian belief, which is the Bible. Theology, then, is a faith-seeking understanding. It is God's view. So when you're going through suffering, it's not your view about it. It's God's view, right? Now, Thomas Aquinas said, theology is constituted by a triple aspect. One, what is taught by God, teaches of God, and leads to God. As Christians, we are under a divine mandate to study the word of God and his character so that we can understand his essence, that is his intrinsic value. His intrinsic value and the nature which is and also is indispensable qualities. One of this is not in my manuscript, but while uh, brother Joseph was ministering this morning. The Lord dropped something in my spirit. And I'm going to interject it right here. One of the first things what we must do in, stud, in developing a theology for suffering is understanding the word of God. And know the word of God. Let me, let me give you an example here. Do you remember when Jesus, um, when, he, when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was led by the serpent where? In the desert to be, test, to be tempted of him. Right? So the, the devil came to him, knew that he was Hungry, 40 days. He said, if thou art the son of God, why don't you command these stones to be made bread? Jesus said, it is written, men shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the word of God. The devil didn't stop there. He took him up to the high pinnacle on top of the temple. And he said, cast yourself down from here. Listen this. This is the devil speaking now. Cast yourself down from here. The devil said to Jesus, who is the word, before it is written, the Lord shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the stone. And then Jesus said to him, hey, it is written, do not tempt the Lord thy God. The devil didn't stop there, he went on again. And he said, he took him to the highest pinnacle of a mountain and he showed him the city and its splendor. And he said, all these things I will give to you if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, get thee hence, for thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. What I'm saying here is this. If you do not know the word of God, you're already defeated and suffering will continue. Here's what I'm saying. You are fighting against the devil. He, if the person who you're fighting with, the thing you're fighting with, knows what you should have to be victorious against him. If you do not have it, you're defeated. You are defeated. You understand. Um, it's, the Holy Spirit dropped this thought in my mind while I sat there. It says, in this current coronavirus environment, not having the word of God is like a healthcare worker walking into a coronavirus environment without adequate PPE equipment. You're going to be consumed. <laughs> Suffering, on the other hand, is a state of undergoing pain distress or hardship. It can be physical, mental, or emotional. From Thomas Aquinas' perspective, then, in developing a theology for suffering, we should ask these three questions while we are going through. 
What has God said about suffering? Don't let your suffering overtake you. What has God said about suffering? What is the lesson God has for me in this season of my suffering? Or how can I get closer to God as a result of the challenges that I'm experiencing? Have a conversation. Pause for a moment and reflect. Reflect. All right. This morning I would like to leave with you just three points. There is suffering in life. One, suffering in purpose. And three, suffering in grace. I did not get, um, do I have a timekeeper? Oh, he's keeping time, so I'm not looking over there. All right. <laughs> suffering is inherent in life because of the fallenness of nature. It is not God's will that we suffer, but it is the path that the world has chosen. God created the world so perfectly and gave Adam and Eve a garden in which to live and told them in Genesis 1 verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and replenish and subdue it and have dominion over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God gave man every herb bearing seed, every beast of the earth, fowls of the earth and everything to his comfort. There is nowhere in that I read, maybe you can show me, that implies that man, it was God's intent for us to suffer. I saw nothing there. No, in the second chapter of Genesis, um, the verse 17, God gave Adam specific instruction. And stay with me right here, because this is why most of us suffer. God instructed Adam not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? For that day he eat of that tree, God told Adam that he shall surely die. God, watch this now. God gave Adam that command when he, Adam, was alone. And at a time when Eve was not yet created. Now, in the immediate verse following that command that God gave him in verse 18, God said that it was not good for the man to be alone. Then later, God caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam and he created Eve. You know the story well. In chapter 3, we saw that the serpent approached Eve. Then Eve approached Adam to do the very thing God commanded him not to do. As a result of Adam disobeying God's order, sin came upon the world. Suffering and death entered the world. Now, God's word is the ultimate authority. And we should not allow another person to influence us in whatever action. God's word is the authority. God gave Adam, not Eve, the command. No, Eve came to Adam. Adam knows what God said. What if any instruction or any advice that you get from whomever, however influential the person is in your life, if it is not consistent with the word of God, do not follow it. Now, the devil, the serpent, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We need to know the word of God and hide it in our heart that we might not sin against God. We have to know the word. Because if you do not know the word, it cannot be hidden. You have to first have a thing in your possession before it can be hidden. So we have to seek the word and we have to read it often. And hide it in our hearts so that we might sin against God. Now the devil presents himself cunningly and in various forms. And he lays snares and traps for the believer. Therefore, we need to have the spirit of discernment to identify these traps and tell the devil to get thee behind, as Jesus told him. For the weapon you see of our warfare, it is not carnal, but it is mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We have the power to cast down imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ and bring into captivity every thought according to the obedience of Christ. Suffering is an inescapable reality of our earthly pilgrimage. But far too many of us have been living at a place I call the crossroads or the intersection of suffering for far too long. And it seems as if we do not have a Christ-centered plan to liberate or free ourselves from such pain, distress, or agony. Suffering is ubiquitous. It is all around us. Some of the suffering is our fault. Sometimes it is not. Oftentimes, our suffering is simply because of man's fallen nature and the broken decisions that we make. And sometimes we suffer because of the challenges that we inherit. Because the parents eat sour grape, right? 
It puts the children teeth on edge. That's suffering of consequence, I call that. That is, we sometimes suffer as a result of the action or condition that we ourselves are not responsible for. The problem, though, is our attitude and our conceptualization of suffering. Simply stated, we have the wrong concept of suffering. And as a result, some of us become addicted to it. Some of us put ownership even on our suffering. Put ownership on our suffering. Then if it's yours, we're going to have to keep it. It's mine. I walk with it. So don't put ownership on your suffering. We say things like, oh, my migraine or my high blood pressure, my diabetes. Do you want it that badly that you wish to own it? These ailments are unwanted visitors. Remember that death and life are in the power of the tongue. And we must exercise caution over what we profess over our lives. I pray in the name of Jesus that we stop owning our infirmities. Healing is the children's bread. The Lord has come so that you can have life and have it more abundantly. And by his stripes we are healed. Remember that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Now, uh, because we have the wrong concept of suffering, it paralyzes those who don't know the secret. And, of course, the secret is that God is with us. Emmanuel, God is with us. He promises never to leave or forsake us. And the songwriter said, oh, never alone. Oh, never alone. He promised never, never to leave you. Never to leave you alone. Remember that the angel of the Lord encamped round about them that fear him. And it delivered them. Also, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. And his ears are open unto their cry. If you are suffering, call to the Lord. Do not call a friend. Because friends will let us down. They are not the authority. Look to the Lord. Look to the hills. From whence cometh your help. Knowing that your help cometh from the Lord. The Lord who has made heaven and earth. Now God has charted a path of escape. Or a path through suffering. To a closer relationship. Watch this. To a closer relationship with each other. And to God himself. Because sometimes my deliverance from my suffering. Is through reverend. Bastiana, Reverend Gilzine, you understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, 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 it's through her because God will use her as a conduit to bless me. Okay? Great, great, great. So let me move on now to suffering and in purpose. It looks like I'm doing well, Mr. Timekeeper. All right, suffering in purpose. James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4, he said, Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, whether you face affliction, anguish, agony, distress, hurt, misery, or pain, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. But let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. I'm talking about no suffering in purpose. If we took the time to study biblical history, it seems that everyone who left a prominent legacy suffered. David, Job, Paul, and countless others, including the suffering servant or Lord Jesus Christ. History shows us that they suffered long, they suffered willingly, and they suffered often. Paul said suffering is designed to accomplish something called filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. Watch this carefully now. What does that mean? Filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction. What does that mean? We know from Paul and Jesus that this verse does not mean you can improve upon the atoning work of the cross. When Jesus declared it is finished, he meant an infinite, valuable, and perfect sacrifice has been made. And no one can improve upon that. Listen what is lacking. What is lacking is the personal presentation for those whom the sacrifice was made for. It's, that's what's lacking. I mean, it's coronavirus time. But we should not be able, the church should be so full this morning, or not full, but understand that so many people should have turned up to come to church this morning that we had to turn them back by virtue of social distancing. What is lacking is a personal presentation. We do not present ourselves wholly to the Lord as our reasonable service. That's what is lacking. Um, so, 
we need to be presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, because that's our reasonable service. Struggling don't always come to defeat you. If truth be told, some struggles are necessary if we are to achieve our dreams and realize our destiny in life. Let's take a look, a brief look at Joseph from the Old Testament. Joseph, you're coming up again. All right. Because he was promoted. No, before he was promoted to the high ranking official and political advisors, he struggled with hatred from his jealous brothers who sold him into slavery. Joseph's struggle continues when he was falsely accused by his master's wife for making a pass at her. And he later suffered the indignity of being in prison. I, let's ponder this question this morning. Had Joseph not suffered, as described just now, and was sold into Egypt, would he have been able to save his family and Israel from the famine which is to come? So there is oftentimes purpose in, in, in suffering. Like Joseph in our struggles, we have to remain steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that all things, not some things, but all things work together for the good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, the Apostle Paul, although not one of the original 12 apostles of Jesus, he was one of the most prolific contributors to the New Testament. Of the 27 books in the New Testament, 13 or 14 are traditionally attributed to him. Now, the book of 2 Corinthians is attributed to Paul, and in the text he said, For as the suffering of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Now, the apostle Paul, he suffered more than most. But regardless of his treatment, his heart was fixed in accomplishing his purpose. His mission was to propagate the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul gave the account of his suffering, and I'll get, list a few here. He said, thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in sea, in journeying often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in peril by my own countrymen. And he went on to list many more suffering in the 11th chapter of Corinthians. But like Paul, we have to remain undaunted by our challenges, knowing and believing by faith that often there is a greater good to be realized from our suffering. Now, many of us have abandoned, stay with me here, I'm going slow in this part. Many of us have abandoned our pursuit or our goals at the first glimpse of difficulty. Many of us have given up on our children, our spouses, our friendship, our dream career, the desire of becoming a homeowner, to name a few. I have a question for you today. Think with me for a minute. I have a question for you. What desired goal have you given up on because of challenges that you had faced? May I remind you that God specializes in things that are impossible. The Lord told us to cast our care on him because he cared for you. When Christ is in the vessel, he will smile at the proverbial, whatever proverbial storm that rolls upon your coast. Remember that with God, you can do the impossible. You can achieve the Im impossible and overcome the insurmountable. That is God. You can do it. With him, you can do it. Whether you are present here in the church are worshiping with us online this morning. It is not too late for us to revisit some of those goals that we have given up on and try again. With godly wisdom, definiteness of purpose, enthusiasm, and tenacity, let us complete the task and achieve our dreams. Because for some, it is as simple as another semester. For others, it could be two more years. For others, it could be writing that book. For some, it could be having the discipline to pay down your debt so that you can improve your debt to income ratio so that you can pursue or achieve your version of the American dream of home ownership. For a few, it could simply be picking up the telephone to make a call to say, I am sorry. It could be as simple as that. Because remember that the sins of unforgiveness is worse than witchcraft. Is it that what preventing you from accomplishing your goal? God requires more of us. 
Let's get it done for ourselves. That's those dreams that we have left abandoned. Let's get them done for ourselves, our children, our community. And in doing so, we will improve the quality of our lives. Raise the standard of living, not only for ourselves, but for also those that are dependent on us. A.J. Cornyn. A Scottish physician and novelist, he said, Life is no straight and easy corridor along which we travel free and unhampered. But it is a maze of passages through which we must find our way. Sometimes lost and confused, now and again, checked in a black alley. Blind alley, he said. He went on to say, but always, if we have faith. He said, but always, if we have faith. Faith is the operative word there. If we have faith, who do we have faith in? Okay, if we have faith, a door will open, not perhaps one that we ourselves would have thought of, but one that will ultimately prove good for us. Today, I'm going to give us a challenge. I like challenges. Challenges are struggles, in another way. So sometimes struggles come, they're a challenge to get you to another level. I'll not, this is not a part of my text, but generally when a plane is going down the runway, it generally... flies in the direction that the wind is blowing. Think about that. The plane needs speed, yet it is dri driving in that which is preventing from uh, getting speed. But they say that which comes to challenge it also helps in ascending. So your challenges sometimes comes to get you to another level. <laughs> Struggles can be purposeful. Struggles can give birth to ideas, dreams, and vision. Let's think about the challenges we face with the COVID-19 pandemic. As horrific a challenge it has been for the country, in fact, the entire globe, many companies have responded to the challenges and have kept the world going, like Zoom, Microsoft, Teams, Amazon, Shopify, right? While the biotech companies like Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, and the others, they are coming up with the vaccines and therapies so that we can have church the way we used to. Now, Wentley Phipps said this, it is in the quiet crucible of our personal private suffering that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation for what you have been through. He could have said that another way. It is in the private crucible of your personal private suffering that, God, that your most noble dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation of your suffering. In compensation of your suffering. In compensation of your suffering. Let me share this story with you about the master weaver and then move on to suffering in grace because we have another that is coming behind me. Let me share this story about the master weaver and then I will hug, hurry on. Now the difference between a student and the master weaver is that the master weaver works with the loom so that the mistake is incorporated into the design of the rug or the loom or the tapestry. In other words, the student makes mistake, but the master weaver comes and changes the pattern of the design of the loom so that the mistakes become incorporated into an element of beauty, of uniqueness in the garment that is on the loom. So there is no need for us to take the entire thing and start again. Stay right there because the master weaver is not who I'm concerned with. This is what our master weaver does. That is what God does with us in the way we suffer, in the way we fail, in the way we fail each other, and in the way we fail him. God, our master weaver, takes our shortcoming and lovingly teaches us and guides us to become better person. God the Father blocks out all our sins and transgression so that, we, so that all that you see now is a transformed sinner saved by grace. You don't see the past. You don't see a transformed sinner. God is gracious and merciful. He is slow to anger and plenty of sin mercy. He will not always chide nor does he keep his anger forever. He, has, he does not deal with us according to our sins and reward reward us according to our iniquities because if he does the church will be empty amen somebody hallelujah somebody <laughs> for those of you that are struggling 
in purpose now. I pray that destiny's door will fly open to you. I pray that divine favor remembers you, that you will prosper in all things. I pray that you might be like that tree that is planted by the rivers of water that bring it forth its fruit in its season. But remember that the ungodly are not so. So you have to live for Christ if you want to be elevated. If you want to be prosperous, you have to live for Christ. We must delight ourselves in him and then he will give us the desires of our heart. Now suffering in grace. The text said for just as the suffering of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. It is clear that suffering is a normal part of the Christian life, especially suffering for Christ. Now, his body and the church, right? Especially suffering for Christ, his body and the church. Unfortunately, many Christians hold an inadequate theology of suffering and are completely annihilated or destroyed by it. In order for us to suffer in grace, we need to know and understand that the path with which we walk with Christ is paved with suffering. No, Philippians 1.29 said, For it has... Stay with me right here. Follow this. Philippians 1 verse 29 said, For it has been granted unto you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 21 said, To this suffering you were called. We need to know that. If you do not suffer with him, you cannot reign with him. If it is our desire to reign with Christ, we have to be willing to submit ourselves to him. We have to. Luke 9, 23. Then Jesus said to them, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. If I may restate that verse for purposes of my work this morning. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up suffering. Let him deny himself and endure suffering. When you are following Christ, when suffering comes, you cannot abandon your pursuit or your desire to walk with God for the comfort of not suffering. Suffering in grace requires us to strengthen our trust in God so that we can understand when we meet with adversity and pain on his, Jesus' account, you are confident that he will deliver you. Jesus overcame the world and if you submit your will to him and live for him and, and live in him and move and have your being in him, as Reverend O'Connor said a few weeks ago, God got you. In order for us to suffer in grace, we have to live totally and completely for the Lord. So that, like William Walford, the blind preacher, we may say, in seasons of distress and grief, my soul has often found relief and oft escaped the tempter's snare by thy return, sweet hour of prayer. Indicative there then is that we must be instant in season, praying always. Always. Paul talks about how Jesus talked with him about his Jesus trial. Paul said, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And I'm saying to you this morning, Jesus' grace is sufficient for you. As it was with Paul, so it is now. Because with God, he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. With him, there is no fearableness, nor there is any degree of turning. He said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul added, I am going to boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power can rest on me. That's why for his sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulties. I delight in whatsoever state you find yourself. Whatever you are going to delight yourself in the Lord. And then he concluded with one of the most astounding truth. For when I am weak, that's Paul. When I am weak, then am I made strong. Are you weak? Strength is there for you. Jesus' strength is there for you. Reach out for him. Open your heart's door and invite him in. He's there. No, Paul suffered in grace because he had the Holy Spirit inspired theology for suffering. Like the Apostle Paul, we need to 
have the desire of knowing God like Paul knew him. How did Paul know Christ? Paul's desire to know him was in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. So we like Paul can suffer gracefully with purpose in the service of God and our fellow man. Now in developing a theology for suffering and for us to suffer gracefully we must do four things and I'm wrapping up real good. That's about 27 minutes. I have three more. Mm. Uh, in developing a Christian theology for suffering and for us to suffer gracefully, we must, one, maintain confidence in the sovereignty of God, knowing that he knows everything. Nothing escapes him. Nothing surprises him. In fact, everything that goes on, God allows it. There is nothing or no one that, out, that exists outside the sphere of God's control. Nothing. We must seek his knowledge. Matthew 6, 33. But seek he first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all things shall be added unto you. If you seek him, even when you're suffering, that thing which you desire will come. Just do not abandon holding on to, to God's unchanging hands. All right. And all things shall be added unto you. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. The last thing I want to tell you here and that's up is James 1, 5. Many of us feel inadequate like we do not know how. But James 1, 5 said this. If any man lacks wisdom let him ask of God when you find yourself at a place of bewilderment at a crossroad of misunderstanding of not knowing what to do seek God's wisdom if any man lack wisdom let him ask God let him ask God right who gives to all men liber liberally and a re reproaches not and it shall be given him so, also, you must practice presence. Practice comfort in the Lord's presence. Whatever you're going through, practice comfort in his presence. Second Corinthians, listen this one here. And I advise you to go home and read it and be encouraged by it. Second Corinthians 1 verse 3. Listen, I'll go slowly. He said, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies. And the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You see the amount of comfort that he has? So you should encourage. We have to practice patience and um, comfort in his uh, presence because there are others that are dependent on us for us to give them comfort because they too are suffering. Okay? All right. In concluding, we have to put a song in our heart. When one understands and appreciates that there is suffering in life, we will ready and readily endure uh, the suffering in purpose. And while we are suffering with and for God, we will suffer in grace. Being able to have a song in your heart while you're suffering is indicative of an understanding of the es that you have an understanding of the essence of God. Also, you need to know that the presence of God, the grace of God, the goodness of God will not only help us to survive or endure, but to thrive through suffering regardless of what the suffering is. Then and only then, you can have a song in your heart. Thomas Dorsey, he had a song in his heart. Thomas Dorsey's wife was about to bear their first child. When Dorsey got the news that she had died during childbirth, he, he hurried home. Then he had his son. The boy was seemingly fine, yet that same night, he died also. He buried them in the same casket. Shortly after, Thomas Dorsey penned the song, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. Now, Francis Havergal died at age 43. She was in poor health for all of her life. She, her suffering did not prevent her from having a song in her heart. She penned the song, Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Who will be his helper? 
other lives to bring? Who will leave the world side? Who will face the foe? Who is on the Lord's side? Who for him will go? By thy call of mercy, by thy grace divine, we are on the Lord's side. Savior, we are thine. Finally, this hymn was written after a traumatic event in Spafford's life. While crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship sank rapidly after a collision with a sea vessel. All four of Spafford's daughter died. His wife, Anna, survived and sent him the now famous telegram, Saved Alone. That does not tell Spafford's full story. Two years earlier, his son died of pneumonia. His only son died of pneumonia. In that same year, much of his business was lost in the great Chicago fire. Yet, Spafford, after suffering such devastated loss and suffering, he, like Dorsey, he, like Francis Abigail, and many more, he, like the Apostle Paul, Spafford was able to pen this song. When peace, like a river, attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. But it's in the third verse, Spafford said, My sins, all oh, the bliss of the glorious thought. My sins, not in part, but in whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear them no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. In closing, I say in suffering, we are reminded of God's love for us. Before God created man, he created a path for us to recover from our suffering. Because he knew that his only begotten would have to suffer to redeem man from their fallen state. You see God's love in that? Before he created man, he knew that he would have to suffer because he would have to send his son to redeem. So I'm saying that Christ, suffering on the Christ suffered on the cross so that we do not have to worry about our suffering because our victory is already assured by the work Jesus did on Calvary. Thank you very much.